Matthew, take us away. Hello, everyone. Happy today. Uh, it's currently Thursday, 9.31 a.m. where I'm at on the planet. Um, and it's a little overcasty. My name is Matthew Hagum. I am one of the co-founders of the Accounting Alchemy Network. Uh, and we are a community of accounting professionals who are here to change the world. And not, not only that, but to empower other accountants to do the same. Um, today, we have another one of our monthly lyceums. This is an environment where we invite somebody from the community to the table to have a conversation with us about something that's important to the community, whether it's something like uh, climate change and climate action or dismantling racism. The conversations have ranged quite extensively. Um, so if you're interested in, in learning more, of course, you can go to our website. You can, If you're watching this video, you're probably already a part of our newsletter. You're probably Probably already in one of our uh, social media groups, both Facebook and LinkedIn. And if you are and you like the content from today's video, um, you know, please do feel free to engage with it. Um, but that being said, I'm personally excited. I'm kind of short changing our intro because I know we've got a lot to talk about. I'm personally excited about today's conversation because as a fellow practitioner, um, trying to figure out how to get my organization to uh, a place where it's in alignment with some of these values and these beliefs and these practices, I'm um, sort of shifting out of the old paradigm. And um, we're lucky enough today to have a guest with us who is on that journey. Um, so I'm going to pass it over to you, Ingrid, to say anything else you want to say about the Accounting Alchemy Network and then introduce our guest today. Over to you. Thank Ingrid. you so much, Matthew. Yes, super, super excited to be on this call with Bill Hershey today, working to turn the accounting profession into a vehicle for positive change in our world. Bill is the proprietor of Lifestream Business Services. Did I get that right, Bill? Lifestream Business Services, that's right. Wonderful. So yeah, today's Lyceum is our first, our very, very first spotlight is what we're calling them. Um, and so for those accounting professionals watching this, if you also have a an accounting practice that really focuses on the kinds of things that we are talking about in the Accounting Alchemy Network, we would love to put a spotlight on your practice too. So Bill has, has popped out in our audience as someone who very much practices what he preaches and um, uses these, these modalities in his business. And we would love to hear all about that. So Bill, if you want to just go ahead and start us off, tell us a little bit about yourself and about Lifestream. Sure. Yeah. And, and I love how you say practice what you preach. And I think practice is accurate because practice doesn't necessarily mean perfect. It means we're working on it, right? And I think we're all works on pro works in progress in some regard. Being here in this uh, Lyceum together, I think we all are folks who are working on it, on ourselves, on our business in some shape or form to offer our best to the world in, in whatever capacity, and whatever means we can. So um, yeah, so where can we go with this? We can go a number of directions. Um, you know, just simply, I'll, I'll explain kind of who I am, who I serve, and maybe, you know, if I can give you kind of like an abbreviated background journey of how I landed in this position, because it's kind of an unlikely windy road. If that, perhaps that'll that be sounds helpful. sounds beautiful. Please, yes, tell us your story. Okay, wonderful. So so where I'm at currently, it's, and I love this, you know, accounting, it's all about, you know, understanding where you're at and where you've come from, right? And once you kind of see where you're at and where you've come from, you can see where you're going and where you want to go in the future. That's that's made me more of the forward thinking, forward looking part of, you know, forecasting advisory, right? But, you know, so the things that we're doing in accounting are very applicable to life in general. Um, right now, I help functional health professionals. So that includes naturopaths and acupuncturists, the holistic folks like this. I help them improve their cash flow so that they can live more fulfilled lives personally and professionally. How did I get to that? You know, that that was that's an interesting windy road. Um, I'm actually working as a business coach doing advisory work. I started as a bookkeeper. Um, I realized that um, bookkeeping wasn't really enough to help these folks um, with their business. You know, they needed a lot more help than I could do simply as a bookkeeper. And honestly, and I think kind of maybe we can commiserate about this a little bit. 
I found that they didn't really value the bookkeeping work. Maybe it's because I wasn't doing an awesome job as a bookkeeper. I'm not sure, but <laughs> I, I, I sense that there's maybe, I think bookkeeping in general is undervalued and, and is really becoming more and more specialized and highly skilled, especially with like e-commerce and all the nuances. So, you know, it's it's it was a delicate process. Part of me moving into deeper work was, I guess, to just be honest, wanting a little bit more appreciation recognition, but also wanting to have a greater impact on people's businesses and on people's lives. I'm a dreamer myself. I want to, you know, feed and nurture other folks' dreams as well. So it's for me, there's nothing greater in my satisfaction of work to see uh, someone's dream come to fruition. So my career is kind of my own dream coming to fruition as well. So let's kind of take a few steps back. How did I even get into a bookkeeping business, right? So uh, in 2020, and, and this is kind of, we're, we're tracing the history back, kind of, you know, going into that previous year p &L kind of thing, right? Uh, in 2020, I actually was living at a meditation retreat center. I lived at that retreat center for over 15 years. I was their bookkeeper, nonprofit, right? And I decided that, and it wasn't even a decision. It was almost like this overwhelming feeling that, okay, something's got to change. It's like, I can't explain it. It's not like, you know, I had wanted to go do a number of things for, for many years. And I was just like, yeah, that would be really cool. But actually, I think I need to stay here at the retreat center and focus on my own self-development some more. That, that I, I'd always come back to that when I was considering other options. But for some reason, um, it was just this kind of like inexplicable, not totally rational thing. And I rationalized it in a number of ways, but I was moved out. You know, it's like my my whole being said, OK, it's time. And uh, I decided, OK, if it's time and it's funny because I didn't I wasn't actually totally clear on what I was going to do. It was like I had all these awesome ideas pulling on me, you know, and during different phases of that journey there. And it was like, OK, well, nothing is really calling me super, super loudly. Like my rational mind was like, OK, well, let's go with what makes the most sense. Let's go with what your heart is calling up for the most. And I decided to study trauma and I decided to study Ayurveda. And Ayurveda is this ancient, beautiful system. It's actually just as much a science as uh, just as much an art as it is a science. And it's, it's mind, body, soul medicine, mind, body, soul health really looking at health from all those levels. And that very much resonated with me, having spent so much time and focus on my own spiritual health, you know, really creating that foundation within that. So how was I going to pay for my own trauma education and Ayurveda education? Um, I realized, okay, you know, my, I, first I hit up my parents. I was like, dad, mom, would y'all support my education in this sort of uh unbeaten you know unpioneered career path of ayurveda you know uh you know it's there are ayurveda professionals out there doing it and doing well but it's still a fairly young industry in in the in the u.s you know it's not a licensed profession um and i and i believe it takes some business savvy to make that career work so my dad didn't see that that was a legitimate business path or a career path. He said, why don't you just get a salary job doing something? Of course, I think everybody in here can probably relate to like how unexciting and that, that obviously that, that didn't land for me being kind of like a passion oriented person. So, uh, you know, over some time, I, convinced him to give me an own, no interest loan, which was super cool of them to fund my education, but I needed to, I needed to make a living. I needed to support myself. So I decided, Hey, I was actually really bored of bookkeeping. I was like, man, I got to get away from bookkeeping. <laughs> it's on with bookkeeping, but that made the most economic sense in terms of how I could support myself with the lifestyle that I wanted to lead. So, you know, the beauty of being sort of 
a virtual accountant these days, a virtual bookkeeper is that you can live anywhere you want. Like Matthew's able to go and be at these different spots, travel around, you know, do cool things and serve as clients, right? Um, that I can be kind of untethered, that, you know, I can, you know, choose my hours, um, that I can choose my days that I work. So, you know, that was very attractive. And um, let's see. So getting our bearings again, started a bookkeeping business, right? And, uh, you know, that, that wasn't necessarily easy, but within a, in a year, I got some momentum. I had some clients. I was successful. I was producing good results for them. Um, I took a live plan training, actually. I, I did a live plan boot camp. For those of you who are familiar with live plan, that's a forecasting software. And they, they train other advisors on how to become a strategic advisor. I was like, that sounds cool. You know, I kind of want to be like the doctor of bookkeepers or the doctor of accounts, really help these deeper level business problems through the number skills. And that kind of set me up. I found like, okay, now bookkeeping is getting cool if it leads to this. and. Um, and yeah, you know, I brought one of my bookkeeping clients into that. Uh, she was at 0% profit, 1% profit, something like that, barely breaking even after paying herself. And um, we took her, but we, we considered some different options. We decided, hey, if we buy this $100,000 laser asset and bring in this statistician who's leaving another practice from across town, looks like that might be a decent opportunity. And so we ran the numbers, we put in the forecast and yeah, I was like, yeah, game on. This will tip the needle pretty quickly, pretty significantly. And lo and behold, it did. She went from within three months, uh, you know, quarter one of this year, she went from like 1% profit, net profit, which I, I should say not profit. I almost said not profit to, um, it's so like 22% not profit, net profit after owner pay. So, um, so I was like, yeah, let's do more of that. And, uh, you know, that gave me my success story that I needed to start promoting to other fu functional health professionals to say, hey, you know, this is really powerful stuff. You know, they don't understand accounting, but they, I think they have an idea of cash flow and like what profit is. So, um, I shouldn't say they, I'm, I'm being very kind of uh, brutish in my broad stroke generalization. So pardon me, all my functional health professionals. I don't mean to, <laughs> there are some of you that are very savvy with accounting. Um, but, you know, even myself, if, if I wasn't a bookkeeper for 15 years, I wouldn't be drawn to accounting. Yeah. So, um, so anyway, that's sort of how I landed in this niche and I guess the one piece that I didn't mention that's worth quickly mentioning here is like I had to you know when I got into the bookie profession okay like who am I going to serve who do I want to serve who I feel passionate about serving and being kind of a guy who is working in you know mind body health myself I wanted to support other people who were doing that and I knew that there was a need there I knew a lot of these folks struggled with their numbers and I wanted to see the insides of what successful businesses looked like. I wanted to see the insides of what businesses that were struggling looked like so that I could potentially build my own successful functional health business one day, which is maybe a few years out still. But um, so I hope I didn't go on too many tangents there. Hopefully that helped give us some context that now we yeah. have sort of a choose your own adventure book that we can play with. It's great. So, so let me just make sure I'm understanding correctly. So that, that main success story that kind of launched you off so that you had a model on which to build your practice. That was just a couple of years ago. That was, so uh, she signed with me as a bookkeeping client in April, 2021. Okay. And we, you know, I took my life plan training in June, 2021. So it's, there's yeah. a pretty short timeline here. Well, I and totally feel you on that. It's and it's one of those things that a lot of the accounting professionals watching this video, you know, might be thinking, "Oh, well, if I haven't been doing this for 15 plus years, I mean, you've been bookkeeping for 15 years, but as far as the advisory, imposter syndrome is huge in the accounting yeah. profession." Yeah. It it's all over me too, you know. I was like, "Yeah, oh, you know, what am I doing here?" The question is, is it working? And, uh, you know, are we able to figure it out? Do we have the knowledge? Can we produce the results? And let's get the imposter syndrome out of the way. And I, I want to just emphasize that for a moment with my own story of, 
When I went to my first accounting conference, Scaling New Heights in 2015, I went to that accounting conference in May with a flip phone. I might as well have been a Luddite. I like didn't do any of the apps or anything like that. I was clueless. And then Scaling New Heights rocked my world and shifted everything. And over the next three months following Scaling New Heights, I flipped my firm upside down. I implemented value pricing. I started doing all of the apps, which I do not recommend implementing a dozen new apps in a matter of months. That is too much. And, you know, fired 20% of my clients and really started like drilling in with the advisory services. And then three months later, I got into the Intuit Firm of the Future contest. And that was what turned everything around for me. It took three months. So just because we haven't been doing it forever does not mean that we are fakes. <laughs> So yeah, it's not about the longevity. It's about clearly you had the skills to help this business owner succeed. And I think that a lot of those skills are built upon your wide, varied base foundation of knowledge, not just in bookkeeping and accounting, but also in health and wellness. And the thing that really turned me on to wanting to talk with you about all of this and have this conversation and have you be our very first spotlight was one of your YouTube videos that I saw where you're talking about what it means to be a holistic accountant. And of course, that video is geared toward your potential clients who are in the wellness industry. But here I'm watching it from an accounting perspective and being like, oh my gosh, we need to talk with other accountants about how to be more holistic. So I would love it if you would give us a little bit of a background on what it means to be a holistic accountant. Right on. You know, I appreciate hearing how this lands for you because I made that video in in like maybe October of last year. So 2021, October. And now I'm feeling like, man, that video is kind of like, I'm like, I I I'm like, is this even valuable? Is this even helping people? Like I'm kind of wondering that about. So it's 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 cool to hear that. And um yeah, so. I'm sorry. I'm kind of a space cadet. Could you reframe that question for me and get me back on track? <laughs> sure. So just if you can touch on what it means to you to be a holistic mm. accountant, how do you rope your foundation of health and wellness into right. your work as accounting? And how do you reframe the numbers conversations with your right. clients in health and wellness so that you don't lose them because they don't want yeah. to hear about their P&L and balance sheet in standard accounting terms? Totally, totally. Yeah, so a couple things here. One, and I'll just kind of name this. I, I don't deeply identify as an accountant. Interestingly enough, I'm doing accounting all day. You know, it's like, I'm, but, you know, I, I'm not sure what that is. You know, I, I guess like if they called me a numbers guy, I'd resonate more with that. Um, so, you know, because of that, I don't suffer as much like imposter. So, oh, I'm supposed to be like an accountant because I can out, an accountant looks like this and I don't look like that. That kind of, you know, just kind of being clear on kind of what I am. I call myself a business coach, you know, like, I don't even know if I really strongly identify with that, um, but it doesn't matter because I'm helping people, right? So um, my brain is kind of a scrambled egg today. So where we're going this this is what is holistic accounting? Is that right? Yep. Okay. Thanks for bearing with my scrambled egg brain. It's all good. Um, it's morning. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, at least here on the West Coast, right? So when I first went, I'm going to start this with a story. When I first went into, you know, this concept, when I was, I was still at the retreat center, I was like, man, bookkeeping and holistic health, they just seemed like two completely like different worlds. And I didn't want to necessarily like have one foot on like one island over here and one foot on one island over here and kind of like straddle that and have like this kind of like this integrated kind of career and life and mind. I, I'm always kind of seeking that integration. And so I was like, kind of just in that kind of creative mind, curious inquiry space of what could that look like to, to mix these two worlds together? And I just started Googling. And I was kind of like looking around like, okay, you know, holistic accounting, holistic bookkeeping, there wasn't a lot out there, right? And just in the course of kind of searching, 
a flash of memory came to me. And one of my previous managers at the retreat center had actually lived in the Bay Area back in like the 2005, 2006 era. And there was a woman there at that time who was a therapist actually by training. And she, because she had a hard time paying for her, her um, student debt that she got from getting her master's degree in her therapist training, she went into bookkeeping as a side hustle to, su to support herself because, you know, she's almost like making like barely a, barely a living wage as a therapist in the Bay Area and, you know, was barely even able to pay off her debt, you know, just hand to mouth living, which is kind of really an intriguing human condition for holistic practitioners. And, and I, it's maybe probably not just holistic practitioners. A lot of folks are in that position. So she got fascinated by numbers. She wanted to figure out this numbers thing. And so her name is Barry Tesler, and she ended up creating this bookkeeping business called Conscious Bookkeeping. It's no longer, her business model has gone through several iterations. It's evolved. Now she's offering a course called Art of Money. And I don't mind name dropping her and, and promoting her stuff because it's awesome. So that Art of Money program was like, okay. And it's, it's, what's really interesting about this is it's, she practices somatic therapy. She's trained in somatic therapy, which is what I was studying. Somatic therapy is this like really effective cutting edge method of processing, metabolizing stress and trauma. So what she was doing that was very kind of groundbreaking, I think, was uh, using the somatic therapy methods to help people do the deep money healing work, right? the deep honey of, of finding our own alignment, finding right relationship with money and finances. So I was like, okay, that is cool. And that is how, what I need to bridge these kind of disparate industries into like, and, and as I went into this, I was like, yeah, I need to get good with money. I was just a renunciate for 15 years. Like, it's like, <laughs> spending very little money, having very little money, having all your needs taken care of, very content. You know, I, I experienced abundance without a lot of money, right? So, you know, decoupling, uncoupling those two things that yes, abundance doesn't necessarily mean cash flow, right? But, um, but I noticed also that a lot of holistic health practitioners needed, you know, I needed it. And by going through it, I was able to see my way through it to some extent. I'm still, you know, working, works in progress, right? We're all works in progress. But I saw that a lot of folks in the functional health industry also need the deep money healing work. I'm actually seeing a lot of folks in the accounting industry also need the deep money. And maybe it's ubiquitous. You know, I think maybe it's the whole country. Maybe it's the whole world. I don't know. But um, it, it's hard to speak for everybody. But that's that's really how I landed in um, this realm of holistic account, holistic accounting, which is it's not exclusive to just holistic health. But really, and, and I'll mention this, and then then you know, I imagine you have all sorts of questions on this. I really feel that even in the functional health, holistic health field financial wellness and financial health is actually probably one of the most overlooked and misunderstood, poorly understood pillars of health. Because if we don't have enough cash flow, we don't have enough money, it's hard to pay out of pocket for that integrative health care, which oftentimes is not covered by insurance. It's hard to afford organic food or, or these other things, right? Uh, it's hard to if, you, if you're overworking and under earning, which is a common problem in the accounting profession. Um, and, you know, I'm still kind of like, you know, working my way out of that, that pit, you know, as a startup entrepreneur, getting to like, you know, where it's like every month is consistent and I'm cruising, like I'm, I'm still getting there. So it's like, uh, I'm putting a lot more hours in right now than I would like. So overworking and under earning, uh, leads to it can lead to stress it can lead to you know not enough bandwidth to do all the stuff that we need to do for self-care get enough sleep have time for cooking nutritious meals um having quality time with kids having time to relax having time to meditate if you meditate or pray or you know have spiritual connection in whatever way 
uh, is is your jam, right? So, um, so full, uh, you know, financial wellness, I believe, will be part of holistic healthcare in the future. Maybe it's not too far off, but I believe that the reason it's not is because so many of the holistic healthcare professionals haven't yet done the healing work and financial wellness yet themselves. And I believe that this, this is, you know, as accountants, we have the opportunity to do this in our work ourselves, to heal our relationship with money, and then also help our clients do it. So accountants and bookkeepers and financial professionals are actually in a unique position where we can be healers. We can be healers. Correct. Yes, correct. So I, I'm just That was jump. a mic drop. I just want to point that out. That was a mic drop. <laughs> yeah. Correct. Right on. Take notes, those of you watching and sharing. Um, so you uh, brought up a lot, right? Um, so I just want to maybe uh, focus on a couple of different things and connect some dots. So I, I think what, what I appreciate about what you're sharing is um, you serve a niche, like I serve a niche. You serve a niche that um, sort of it's sort of ironic in a way, right? That like they 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 sit in the space of well-being and yet and yet this thing called financial well-being hasn't hasn't made its way um to, in certain populations or community you know i know i'm i know i'm generalizing here and, and me too and i apologize for all the like well, crash but, generalizations but, i make but yes well, i think we're but, kind but of honestly, like seeing a pattern yeah but honestly it's it's not generalizing it, I think it's just noticing a, a, a common pattern that's, that's right. a, or rather a prevalent pattern, right? Like in my space, right? Um, I work with artists, um, you know, and, and, and as much as I want to sit there and, and talk to them about like, you know, their chart of accounts or like how they record transactions, it really doesn't matter to them because right now what they're dealing with is that they live inside of an econ economic system that will that thinks paying them a hundred dollars to show up for a gig is actually money. I mean, it is money. It's green dollar bills that'll go into their bank account, but it's not like it took them 20 years to learn that skill. It took them 10 hours to practice for that one event. They show up and do this thing and, and, and they get a hundred dollars. Right? Like, so, so, so for me, I think what I and what I appreciate about your storytelling too about sort of navigating this dynamic is it's like, you know, what earlier on we were talking about like the, what is an accountant, what is a bookkeeper, what is that person's responsibility, and it's like we're we're sort of in this sort of paradigm of of like old paradigm, new paradigm, right, where we have to walk um, the line or find the balance, or whatever the analogy appropriate analogy is there between these two worlds. Um, it to the extent that we actually have to we do have to tend to the the fact that there's some things that that need to be tended to even though systematically they're problematic right um but we also have to be sort of nurturing this new future right and and what i like about what you bring up is you know in my view um it's it you know accountants have a responsibility Right. I don't think a lot of accounts rely, realize that they have a responsibility, but they have a responsibility to the financial well-being of their clients. Right. But that means they have to understand what the word well-being means and how it's practiced in the process of engaging with this system called the financial system. Right. Um, and so, you know, I, I and, and it's it's interesting because you were talking about coupling and decoupling money and 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 part of what I am aware of and this is something that we're aware of inside of the accounting alchemy network and and for those of you who aren't aware you know we've got we've been doing some work with the Pachamama Alliance we got integrated into this whole thing called the Awakener that shifted us into this thing called the Game Changer Intensive and one of the components of the Game Changer Intensive is talking about changing the narrative changing the story right um. And so I guess my question for you, Bill, because really, really, this is what we need to do as a, in my opinion, this is what we need to do as a profession. We need to change the story, right? We need to start decoupling and recoupling and unpacking and, and re repacking um, our belief systems around what is money? How does it show up in our life? What practices are, are going to be regenerative and supportive of our well-being, of our clients' well-beings, of our communities' well-beings, et cetera, right? So, so I'm curious. 
if you think about your experience working with like that first client you talked about where you had that breakthrough right with them around their financial um, their financial impact or their financial circumstance what what was the what was the story or the or the or the thing that that you were helping them to shift their relationship to in this narrative of how they relate to money like what was what was that that thing that got that got shifted um, that made the difference for them? Do you get what I'm asking, Bill? Does that make sense? I, I think so. You know, there's each client relationship is different, right? And some folks are really, you know, more in the like, okay, let's talk about business. And some folks are really more in the like, okay, let's talk about, you know, some of the softer things. And, uh, you know, in, in with folks who are maybe more inclined to do some of the softer work, you know, it's getting more into mindset and, and things like that. You're like really feeling into like, okay, how does that feel to, you know, feel that discomfort around your pricing or around having a sales or enrollment conversation, right? Um, with this particular client, it was really more just very practical. You know, she's, she's a doctor, uh, an, a naturopathic doctor. And very busy. And um, really, I, I think, you know, the key here is understanding why this is important and getting that context. And, and really, that's how I start every client relationship. When I'm on a prospecting call with somebody, it's like, okay, well, we can potentially work together. Why is this important to you? And why now? Like, where, what would be the ideal outcome for you with your business? So, yeah. So, so what was important, like what became important to that client that wasn't important before? I guess that like, I, I'm, I'm wanting to, mm -hmm. like, what is the change that occurred for them? Right. Right. Cause right. I, you, you see, cause I, cause I, I, I think like when I work with my clients, um, you know, they're all artists, right. Mm. So unless they feel like their creativity is being prioritized, then a conversation with them about income generation strategy or revenue models or or mm. proper you know sales tax collection right. it's like it's like it's almost like a, 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 a an assault to their their yes, need because like, they're, they're like mean, i'm already struggling to create and you're asking me about sales tax right now like like i wanted to use a bad word but like you know right. that, insert blank you like i just want to go make art like well, the universe is not letting me make art right now like why are you asking me about that right and so yeah. so for me it's about saying like no don't you i i need them to understand that their financial empowerment enables their creative potential in a way that they haven't realized yet right there's a shift that they have they have to realize oh wait if i see that if i see money differently if I have a different story about capitalism, if I have a different relationship to corporate structure, right, or the lessons that we've learned from entrepreneurship and business, or, or then all of a sudden that change creates the opportunity for them to be something different with their money. So my yeah. question, and, and, and it, uh, this is, I think this is, you know, every population has a distinct um, issue that they might be facing, um, right? So I'm curious, like with the clients that you serve, whether it's that client or, or, or across the spectrum, it's like, what, you know, what is the thing that they need to, that, that you're seeing is needing, needing to be shifted in the story of how these wellness practitioners are related to financial well-being? Like, what's the, what's the, the chiropractic adjustment, if you will? Right. Um, yeah, sure. I, I love this question, by the way. You know, with this particular, I, it, and I do have, I know where you're going, and, and I have a method that I use to help, uh, like, a, not just a method, but I would call it a framework. Uh, with this particular client, though, who, who made this shift, she was ready to make money. She was ready to have these conversations and really look at it. So that was different. You know, she she's running, a, you know, a practice with several employees, and so she's, she's been an entrepreneur for several years. So she kind of gets it, you know, it's, it's maybe not like the most comfortable thing for her, but, um, but yeah, so she's doing the work and, you know, I, and it's, you know, for her to have someone like me to come and come in and really be able to speak to the numbers. I think that that really helps her that she doesn't have to carry that all and, and necessarily even under have to understand it all, you know, it's like, okay, like one of my, 
people say it's just so nice to know that Bill's got my back, you know, like for, for you and your clients, just to know that, okay, you, you're supporting them. You, they don't have to get it all. They don't have to know it all, but here's the thing. And I actually, I, I work with this more, I would say the naturopathic doctors in general, I find are a little bit, maybe more number inclined because they get labs, you know, like the profit and loss is kind of just like a lab for your business. You kind of like see the lab data updated each month, right? Um, you know, some of the more like left brain, no, right brain, some more of the creative brains, you know, professionals like Ayurveda and yoga and, and therapists, I noticed that it, it may be a little bit more of a struggle for them. And so what I use to help them make that shift is to realize that their financial well-being, their cash flow, their numbers are intimately connected to their ability to fulfill their life's purpose and to work within their passions. And in the, for those of you who might be familiar with like the, the tradition of yoga. So yoga as a tradition, not just like um, these physical postures or asanas that we go through, but there's actually this deep philosophical tradition around yoga. They describe these four core aims of life. So these four core aims of life, the, the, they use Sanskrit words to, to label these, these, you know, key like motivators in life, right? All are important. None, none are, none can be like pursued on their own exclusively to be a balanced and fulfilled human being, but none of them can actually be excluded either. So the first one is just desire. They call it in, in Sanskrit, we call it kama. Hope we don't mind me just kind of like giving you the, the Sanskrit label here, just in case you hear it somewhere else, say in a yoga class, it'll kind of like plant this. You know, like, I think I heard that before. This is so, so nerdy on. cool. Thank you. <laughs> right on. Wonderful. Glad you enjoyed it. So yeah, yeah. So I'm glad I'm in, in, in the room with nerds, fellow nerds. Love it. So kama is just desire. It's like, we need desire. We need to eat. We, we're thirsty. We need, we have a desire to be thirst, but we have a desire to enjoy life as well. We have a desire and a need, I think, a legitimate need to enjoy the work that we do. Because look, look at it. We spend like 30% of our life, literally 30% of our life hours working, right? Like studies have shown that. So may as well enjoy that. You know, what's the point of just like, you know, slogging through that and kind of like not, it just, I couldn't do that. Some people can do that. I couldn't do that. So, you know, Kama is important, this, this, this passion, right? Artists have that down. They're, they're like fo so focused on the passion, there's these other parts that might actually be neglected that, that need to actually support that passion work, right? So the next one is uh, wealth or abundance, like material abundance, I should say. Uh, the, the Sanskrit word for that is arta, so, which is interesting. It sounds like art, right? So I bet there's a way to play with those words for the artist crew. So, you know, I call this, for, for my Ayurveda people, I call it Artha Sadhana, which means like, you know, your money practice, your, like the practice that you're going to, and these people get practice because they're practicing a craft. Um, you know, a lot of these folks have spiritual practice in some form, uh, not all of them, but some of them. So that I think a lot of these folks get it. So Artha Sadhana or a money practice is uh, these are the things that we do to support ourselves uh, in, in the material world through resources. And then it so happens in our money driven society, our resources often equated with money. So, um, and those are the things that allow us to, you know, you know, support our family, to have food on the table, have shelter, all those things, which are important to have cool tools that, and implements and things that you can use as an artist, cool instruments if you're a musician. So art is important right? Um, it, it allows you to invest more into your craft and into your well-being, which is going to be make you a better artist. So um, Arta is important. It's, it's there. To, it's like a pyramid. If we envision this as a pyramid, we have this desire, we have the Arta, and these are supporting. Then you have this third thing. Uh, it's purpose. Uh, in the Sanskrit, we call it dharma. So you're calling. What you're here in this world to do? Maybe we're not always clear what we're here in this world to do, or maybe you know, maybe the call of the hour is different from the call of the life, right? You know, maybe we get called to do certain things. 
So, you know, it may be raising a family, it may be serving your community, it may be serving a movement, serving like a, a, a larger change in society, right? So what are you called to do? In order to fulfill that calling, you need sufficient arta. You need sufficient resources to support you. So you have the bandwidth to put time and energy and perhaps even money into that, right? So and you're obviously going to be passionate about that if, if that's what you're called to do, um, usually at least. Um, and then this fourth stage is, is they call it uh, like spiritual fulfillment or moksha, right? And so, um, you know, for folks who are kind of like yogis or spiritually oriented or like me for 15 years, I was very, very focused on that. And I was in a living situation that allowed me to be very, very, very focused on that. And my living needs were taken care of. So I didn't have to worry about the art time. It was great. Right. It was like, I don't have to worry about that. So um, working from that framework, you know, if you have this like moksha, you're working towards spiritual realization, or you have this comma, and you don't have sufficient economic foundation, you don't have sufficient artha, you have this unstable structure, and it's going to impair your ability to actually be fulfilled as a human being. So it's really, you know, whenever we're talking about these numbers, I'm always connecting it to what's meaningful to them and how that supports what's meaningful to them. And just over time, I think people start to get it. Does that make sense? It totally does. And I wanna just bring voice to some of the things that I'm seeing in the chat. Alina just posted in the chat here on Zoom, so brilliant. And then on the Facebook side of things, we've got Katrina blowing it up on our Facebook chat. Um, <laughs> earlier she was saying, yes, much needed healing work at our views toward money, um, mic drop moment, Changing the narrative, art expression versus money matters, discomfort and disconnect, need to, need money to fulfill their life's purpose and work within their passion. And that was five minutes ago. So I feel like you totally just spoke to what Katrina was commenting on there. And then, yeah, she was also <laughs> loved this. So, so nerdy and so cool <laughs> with the, the this being a nerdy, cool conversation. And I just, I love how you're able to bring in so many diverse ideas to use these tools as leverage to shift the narrative because the main thing that a lot of people I feel don't notice about money right away is we're taught as children that money just is it's a fact of life it is just a thing that is out there that might as well be matter but it's not matter you know, it's you, you look at an apple, a thing that was grown in a tree that has solid form, or even, you know, the air we breathe, the water we drink, the things around us, the earth beneath our feet. But money is not any of those ideas. We can create material representations of it in the form of dollars and cents. But money is just an idea. It's a story. It is the the language that we use to represent the energy flows in and out of our lives that create the things that we want and need to manifest in our lives. And I feel like as you were, as you were trying to pinpoint that moment for the client of like, what is that thing? What is the shift for me with my clients? That's often the moment when their neural synapses disconnect from their old beliefs and reconnect with the new beliefs of, oh, it doesn't have to be that way. The things that maybe I was taught about money as a child or that my parents believed or that I'm reading in magazines and newspapers, that that, that doesn't necessarily have to be how it is. That I can change my relationship to money and finance and that shifts my relationship to Arta and to my spiritual fulfillment, and it shifts how I approach my life and how I show up in the world and the energy that I'm putting out into the world and how and how much I am receiving back. It shifts all of that and it removes the blockages from the flow, these, these dams that were put on our river by our current societal constructs, primarily 
institutionalized racism and patriarchy. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, calling a spade a spade, looking at how those things root into our colonial culture and what it looks like to heal from that as humanity. Mm. So there's there's so many amazing ideas that we can bring into it. And I love, Bill, that you brought up trauma earlier, because that's one of the things that I really like to bring up, you know, in conversations with my clients and also in the courses that I teach with accounting professionals um, with ACES training, adverse childhood experiences. There are scientific studies that show that two thirds of us, 66% of us have at least one, if not more experience in our childhood that altered our brain development. And not just normal stress of like, oh, something bad happened, but what they call toxic stress. So prolonged exposure to the stress chemicals in our body, adrenaline, cortisol. And when cortisol is in our bodies for too long, it acts as a neurotoxin. It snips off brain cells saying, you don't need those, you're under stress, just survive. And those survival mechanisms change how we adapt and grow into adults. They shift how we communicate. They shift how we cope with stress moving forward. They shift the way that we see the world. And so acknowledging that two thirds of the people that we interact with on a daily basis grew up with some form of toxic stress in their life. When we recognize that and we develop trauma-informed practices that are focused on human interactions that are holistic and healing in nature, it changes how we go about business because we can go about business in much more humane and personal ways. I mean, toxic business says, oh, it's not personal, it's just business. There's no such thing. These are our lives and our livelihood. Everything is personal. And we need to start changing the way that we interact with people. And so we've got a fantastic uh, question in the chat. Um, Alina is asking, Bill, do you have sessions with your clients to discuss this stuff or courses? And I know I saw one of your courses on YouTube, just that quickie, I think it was 20 minutes or half hour video. And how do you do it and get the technical work done? So how do you take this holistic foundation and then also do the books? Where's the balance in there? Yeah. And that was actually the tricky thing. I realized that there's only so much you can do. Like I was doing monthly meetings with my bookkeeping clients. And I realized, wow, you know, it's really not enough to do the deeper work. And, you know, someone has to be really wanting to do the deeper work in order to go there, you know? Um, you know, in the beginning, I was just kind of experimenting. Hey, would you like to do some kind of like, these somatic exercises that I learned from my somatic experiencing training, somatic, this, this therapy technique that I learned, right? And, uh, you know, they'd be like, okay, sure. And, you know, it, sometimes it landed, sometimes it didn't. Some people were comfortable with it, some weren't. So there was a lot of experimentation there. But in, in reality, uh, I, there were some great results that came out of those and some just like not so noticeable, but I think it probably had some effect. Uh, but the reality is, you know, just in a monthly session, it's not really so easy to do that and cover everything else that needs to be covered and, you know, helping people um, do what they need to do to or know what they need to know to navigate their financial situation, right? So I actually offer now a nine-week um, coaching program that I'm starting to, I'm starting to offer as a three-month program. I spread it out over three months. And that allows us to go much deeper. And even there, sometimes there's not quite enough time, you know? And so, you know, if folks wanted to, they could do one-off sessions to do that. Um, but what I'm realizing is, is sometimes it's actually difficult to be both, playing both roles. Uh, it's sometimes it's difficult to be kind of the numbers and practical guy and sort of the person doing the deep work. And of course, we have to be careful as accountants, you know, if we're not a trained therapist, we have to kind of understand scope to some extent to realize like, okay, like, yeah, I'm not a licensed therapist. I'm not here to practice therapy. I can help you like learn some things to become a little bit more mindful and more aware of, you know, what's going on maybe in your relationship with your money and your business, right? 
But if deeper trauma is, is really showing itself, or if I'm seeing some signs and, you know, as you go into this, you might start to recognize what some of those signs are. If there's signs that someone has some deeper trauma that's really affecting their business or, or their relationship with money, some, a lot of times I'll just refer, I'll say like, Hey, and I have a network of people that I refer to like, Hey, I got like these five people and they're awesome at what they do. And, you know, maybe, maybe find one of these that, that you feel resonant, connect, a resonant connection with, or if I know the person, I feel like, man, you'd be a great connection, a uh, great fit for like Deborah Clydesdale or Karen Robbins or some of these other great somatic experiencing therapists out there. Right. So, and, and in some cases when, you know, maybe more in the coaching world, um, I may actually require it because I'm realizing like, I'm not going to really be able to help you unless this thing over here is kind of, it, it seems like this, I'm not a therapist. I can't say exactly what's going on, but it seems like there's something there and it seems like it might need to be taken care of in order for you to go forward and be able to work with the numbers in your business in, in a more effective way. And so, you know, I'm very gentle, very sensitive about that. Right. But I love um, that. yeah. So and I do a similar that helps. thing. Yeah, it does help a lot. I do a similar thing in my own practice. And I think it's important um, for us as accounting professionals to recognize that, yes, we are not therapists and it is important to be able to refer people when they need that kind of help in the same way that we're not attorneys. And, you know, for, for us in the management accounting side of things, I'm not a tax accountant in the same way that I have a bunch of tax accountants who specialize on the tax side of things that I can tap when I've got questions and refer people to, I don't give tax advice and I don't give medical advice or psychological advice. However, it's important for us to recognize that we do not need a degree in psychology to offer compassion to another human being and to hold space for them and witness their emotions when they're having a tough time. Because when it comes right down to it, we were talking about those adverse childhood experiences and the, the, the way that people process emotions, we need to be able to create a safe space for our clients to connect with us when they're feeling things about their businesses. This is an emotional ride. And numbers, money conversations are triggering topics. For call a spade a spade, most people are triggered by money conversations, plain and simple. Accounting professionals, when you're in that meeting with your accountant, they've got the like glazed over or deer in headlights look. It's not that they're bored or not paying attention. It's because they're emotionally flooded. It's because what you're saying is over their heads and they're afraid that if they speak up and say, I'm sorry, I don't get it. Can you say it again? You're going to make them feel stupid. And they already feel stupid. It's terrifying for them. And if we can't create safe space to cultivate those conversations and meet them where they are, we're doing them a disservice. We're not actually helping them. And we've got some great things going on in the chat. Oh, yeah. Okay, so Bill's asking um, Alina's question about the courses. Yes, Bill says, uh, I have courses going to the functional health folks, although I find it's more effective to work one-on-one. -on -one. And Alina says, we have to do our own work to be able to do that, though, in my opinion. Yes, we have to be ready to do our own work and show up for that. If, if we as accounting professionals have not done our own emotional heavy lifting, have not begun to address our own trauma, whether that be our personal real lived experience or maybe our epigenetic experience that has been passed down. Um, if you're not familiar with epigenetics, this is some fascinating science that is worth looking into because the traumatic experiences of our ancestors can be passed down for six generations. Depending on how quickly your family breeds, it's 100, 150 years. It takes a while, you know? So when we think about you know, the experiences that our ancestors had, particularly experiences around institutionalized racism in the United States and what it means to grow up in a country that had slavery. Many of us on an epigenetic level still remember some of that history. 
and need to work through it. And we need to be able to hold space for those conversations and figure a lot of that out. So we've got about five minutes left. And there's one question that I still really, really want to touch on because I feel like we've got a cool opportunity here with you, Bill. We've been talking about your amazing focus on um, holistic health practices. And that's basically your niche. And a lot of accounting professionals have been talking about niching in the profession for quite a while. And people have a hard time choosing their niche and, and their focus. And you related to us a bit your story about selecting your niche. And I'm seeing just based on what you're saying, a little bit of a parallel between how you selected the area of focus that you wanted to specialize in and your own spiritual drives. What was it, the moksha? And your purpose in this world, you have tied in your deeper foundation of who you are on a spiritual and purpose basis into your practice. And I would love to hear a little bit more on what advice would you give to other accounting professionals watching this recording on how they might be able to choose their niche? Right on. And yeah, I, I want to give it to everybody here that it's not super easy to come to niche. And it wasn't just, yeah, functional health professionals was was one of my top choices. It was, it was actually my top choice. But I was also at some, a certain point like, oh, should I niche with nonprofit organizations or should I niche with just conscious businesses in general? And um it was through experimentation and trial and error. Like, you know, I'd been a nonprofit bookkeeper for 15 years I, and I had a nonprofit last year that I worked with. And I realized that I'm not so sure if I want to be in the nonprofit. I had to kind of live that out to realize, you know, that's that's not really where I find my joy uh, for a number of reasons. I won't go into it. I respect the folks who are doing nonprofit accounting. It's needed. Right. But that's not where I was feeling called. Um, you know, conscious businesses, I just wasn't really clear, like, how do I market to that? And even within conscious businesses, there's so many different kinds of businesses. Do I really want to learn, you know, all the, you know, you know, all the different types of conscious businesses are out there. So I really wanted to get a little more singular and understanding an industry. And, and I just, you know, I'm, I'm in the functional health world. So it made sense for me to just go really deep into that. Um, yeah, and it's not that I, I would still take other clients. Just because I chose a niche doesn't necessarily mean I'm going to exclude anybody. I could if I wanted to, if I had enough traffic and volume and I knew I could really scale this and like deliver a tremendous amount of value, I could say, oh, like you're a travel industry business, I'll send you to Ingrid, right? It's like I, I could do that. And I probably will actually, because, you know, right now I'm getting enough leads in the functional health field that I don't necessarily need to try to learn another industry, which is, I think, as you get more into the advisory piece, it becomes much more valuable when you have that deep industry knowledge, uh, when you can really like, hey, you know the connections, you know the people, hey, you got to talk to this person over here if you're dealing with that problem or, or whatever it is, right? So I think niching is, is especially helpful if you're going to go into advisory work. Um, it's not super necessary, but uh, yeah, anyway, I, I think, gosh, you know, we're talking about like feeling your feelings, maybe just feel your feelings about who you're currently serving and like what clients do you most enjoy helping you know like what are those types of clients and what do you like about them and, and would it be cool how would it feel to have like five or ten or twenty more clients like them and then we kind of you know so niching is kind of reverse engineering that how do we find more of this you know we call it the like the ideal client or the client avatar and you know what problem are you solving for them? You know, we're not just filling out a tax return, you know, or, or maybe you are, but then you're probably not really, you know, there's probably not a need to niche if you're kind of like one of those commodity services, right? Um, <clears throat> but if you're doing something a little more specialized like advisory, you know, what, what problems are you solving for them? Are you helping them become more profitable? Are you helping them build a successful um 
you know, travel business or are you helping them as an artist actuate their potential as an artist entrepreneur? Um, you know, what is it? And then, you know, it's like, then your niche becomes that, you know? So I marketing for bookkeeping and accounting professionals is not necessarily my specialty. I know there's, there's folks out there who, who do really well teaching that. Um, but yeah, I think it's, especially if going into advisor work, I think it's worth, um, worth getting into that. And there's a lot of blockages that come up, can come up. I recommend seeking support, talking to other professionals, join groups, um, where, where folks are doing that and working through it. Thank you, Bill. Um, yeah. So we are we are at time. So I want to just acknowledge um, a couple of things. Um, first of all, thank you to those of you who are listening to the recording or the replay. Please comment below, uh, and we'll we'll track that. And of course, if you're inside of the communities of our social groups and you love this content and you're inspired by something, um, uh, then please share that comment there, Alina. I want to uh, uh, acknowledge you, for example. I'll share this comment from Alina. Um, this conversation has been very, very inspiring. Lots of my own realizations happening here. Thank you for sharing so openly, Bill, Ingrid, and Matthew. So if this content does touch you and inspire you the way that it has done for Alina, please, again, um, share that below. And I, I guess I'll, I'll start to say this, Bill. I, I get, one of my biggest takeaways from what you shared um, and, and me sort of answering my own question as a result of how you responded um, not to say that you didn't answer the question, but how I translated that um, was, oh, you knew their language. You also knew the language of accounting. You appreciated both and you were then able to map them together and say, oh, this is like that. And then because you were able to map, it's not that they needed to learn anything new per se, except for that the translation of that this is that. And so if you believe this, then you can believe that and therefore and now let's put these pieces together so that it's like a holistic integrated understanding that's in alignment with who you are and what you stand for and i think the whole thing about the niching is really interesting because it's like niching gets presented as a marketing solution it's not a marketing solution it's it's marketing is a way to attract custom ideal customers it's convenient when you've niched your business Right, but the niching occurs because what we're, I'll use myself as the example, because I am an artist, I understand how to talk about money in a way that can be heard based on the current paradigms of the sort of macro ecosystem of the arts world, right? And so that I can then translate into the new paradigm, right? So, so the niching actually gives you the ability to be able to sit in that deeper um, space of being able to serve a community through this transition, right? Again, which is like, I go back to, we just finished reading Sacred Economics and it's all about transforming from one paradigm to the other. And that's kind of what we're doing and building this community. So I think, I think what I'm also appreciating is that you give us an example of, of a practitioner in this industry who is actually experimenting with what does it mean to, 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 to develop this business in this transitional phase of our culture of our economic system. So, um, so thank you, Bill, for being our guest yeah. today. We really appreciate it. A um, lot of inspiration here for sure. Um, Ingrid, do you have anything else to say before we close the close the room? I think we rocked it. This was so great. Thank you so much, Bill. My pleasure. Yeah. Uh, kudos to everybody here. You know, we're all playing this world of uh, this role of world bridgers. You know, we're helping bridge the worlds into I love how you're really articulating this new paradigm of how we can be working in, yes. in our roles as accountants and in our roles in helping a new economy emerge. So love the work that you're doing. Thank you for having me. Thank you. And thank you to our members who joined us in the chat, both on Facebook and here on Zoom. And stay tuned because we have a social forum lyceum coming up later this month following Appy Camp, which Matthew and I will be at next week. So 
cool stuff going on in the world of accounting, great conversations going on that we would love to share with all of you. And please send your questions your, our way and let us know what you'd like to see from this community and the opportunities that we are generating here, because we can turn this into whatever we want to turn it into. And we need to hear from our network what that looks like for you. All right, so with that, I think we're all set to go. Thank you everyone so much and we'll talk more soon. Ciao. Bye. See ya.